Welcome to the God Story Radio Broadcast with Chaplain Lynn. Thank you, Brother Ron. This is Chaplain Lynn. God's Story is a ministry outreach about our great, caring God being seen in and throughout His people's lives. Many say, Does God care about me? Does He see what I'm going through? Does He know me personally? God's Story tells of His great love for people like you and me. The greatest demonstration of His love is His precious Son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross of Calvary for our sins. The veil between God and mankind has been torn open. Be encouraged as you listen to today's testimony or sermon from a changed life now filled with a passionate love for Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Good afternoon. Our lovely guest today is Marjean. I met Marjean at the Hamilton Aglow which meets in the Presbyterian Church, 23 South Front Street in Hamilton, Ohio. Their meetings are open to both women and men and start at 9 o'clock a.m., the first Saturday of each month. It is a wonderful meeting. For each month, a new speaker comes and shares their testimony. That is where I heard Marjean's testimony, which shows God's restoration and redemption of the great sacrifice Jesus made for us on the cross of Calvary. Welcome, Marjean. Well, thank you, Lynn. Yes, God bless you. It's so wonderful to have you here today. Glad to be here. Oh, praise the Lord. Would you like to start your testimony? Sure. Psalm 66, 16 says, Come here, all you who fear God, and I will recount what God has done for my soul. And Christ's living water has made the desert of a wounded sinful life blossom as the rose like in isaiah 35 yes yes i um have a testimony like everyone does we are all born sinners and at three when my mother and dad brought home my youngest brother i knew i had to love him but nothing was said about rejecting my mom so that orphan spirit of um rejection took over my life and at five, I was sexually abused, and at 10, and um, at eight, I started experimenting with alcohol down in the basement, and um, by 12, I was smoking, and but I managed to hold it together, basically. I had my bachelor's in at ed- elementary education and my master's in guidance and counseling, and I taught, And but when my then ex introduced me to pot, it was downhill from then. Oh, I understand. I understand. Sometimes it's it's a downward slide. We start with something little, and it just uh, <clears throat> increases. Wow, wow. Well, and bad choices usually follow bad choices. Yes, yes. I totally understand. Well, you had um, <clears throat> gone through a lot of self-accusation and criticism of yourself. Oh, yes, yes. When we're not perfect, you can either turn to the Lord and know it's all about Jesus' perfection, and he wants to put his perfection in, into our account. Or we can go under the shackles of legalism, which generates a relentless stream well, you of were, self-accusation. Exactly. And you mentioned to me, too, that at age six, you heard away in the manger, oh. and um, you were seeking love. You were seeking acceptance. You were seeking approval. And how did, when you were at that age, how did, what did the effect did that have on you? Well, when I heard the third verse of Away in a Manger that Christmas after I had been sexually abused, it goes, Dear, be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay close by me forever and guard me, I pray. Bless all thy dear children in thy tender care. And right then I knew I wasn't on God's A-list. And... I strove to be perfect and to earn his approval and his blessing, but always with the doubt that that would ever happen. I just did not feel that I was okay. I felt always that I was less than. My self-esteem was not there. And, of course, when you trust people that are not trustworthy, then 
you end up not trusting God. You don't even know that trustworthy people really exist. And so it creates havoc in your life, and bad choices follow bad choices until so something were, happens. So you were very, very wounded, even from a little child. Oh, yeah. Yeah, extremely wounded. Yeah. And um, I, I've heard her testimony already, and you mentioned that you act out areas where we are wounded. Oh, definitely. Can you explain about that a little bit? Well, yes. Those that don't have, the ones that we do perfectly have closure. You know, if we do it okay, it has closure. But the areas that were wounded have no closure, so we keep acting out in those areas, hoping to find some closure, like the stealing thing. I stole since I was five, stole things that were of no value or importance, but I stole. And later when I read a column in Dear Abby, it said that when something precious has been stolen from you, that you then steal. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And it kind of empowers you because now you're the Stealer, you're in control. Of, yes. So you're seeking control where control has been taken away from you. Oh, yes. Or, or your voice. You lost your voice as a little child. Oh, yes. And you you took everything inside yourself and held. I mean, even the sexual molestation, you kept that inside yourself as a little girl and, and told no one. Right. Which is a normal. 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 Very few people tell. And because we don't tell, we don't get help, and we think it's all our fault, and that we're bad. And because bad happened to you, then you think we're bad, and then we do bad, and it's a downhill. But then your mess becomes your message, and your test becomes your testimony. And Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, your trouble becomes really a triumph in your yes, life. Yes, there's victory. Did, were you threatened to not talk? through the, me- the sexual mustal- molestation? Not by the person. I just did not want... Anybody to know? No. And also, I didn't want my mom to have to make a choice. Yes, you were protecting, which is probably common. Very. You protect everybody else while you're going through tremendous turmoil inside yourself. Right. Yes. Oh, that's totally understandable. Amen, amen, and amen. So the nearer we draw to the light, the more our imperfections are made known, but that also gives God the opportunity to reveal the lies of the devil and to implement his truth and help us to apply that into our life. Exactly, and forgiveness is number one. Oh, it's huge, but... It's so difficult. Yes. Because you see everybody else going on about their life, and they're, you know, the, they have all this in a box of rocks and a bag of chips, you know, and yet you are pretty much not. Yes. And yet even that in itself really helped because then I had an affinity with Jesus because he also took on the sins of other people. Yes, that's understandable. And it was like, wow, I really do have a big brother that understands about paying for other people's sins. Yes, you can mm-hmm. really relate because yeah. he, he walked in your shoes. Yes. Amen and amen. Yeah, he's a wonderful Savior. And you know, our religion is the only one that has a Savior. Everybody else's religion is if you're good, outweighs your bad, then you get whatever. But only Christianity knows that There's no way we can be good enough to earn God's favor that Jesus already did that. And it's all about him. And once our focus changes, you know, I was very self-centered. Everyone comes self-centered and self-focused. And though the more God spoke truth into my life, the more it became more about Jesus. And that's when the healing really started. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So um, when you were um, 16, something happened to you again, too. You had another situation. I had my virginity stolen from me. I was tricked, didn't know. And that's one thing that we trust those that are not trustworthy, and 
we kind of stick our heads in the sand and we just want to believe what we want to believe, but that's not reality. Mm -hmm. And then once that happened, um, you know, you just feel like you're totally used goods and there's nothing more and you might as well and oh well. Exactly. And since we act out in the ways we've been wounded, and if you've been wounded sexually, you act out sexually. And I didn't do that a lot, but you do. Yes. And it was a long time before I found out that sex was holy and not common. Because if you're introduced to sex when you're five, it's yes, very it's, common. Yes. And so we bec you become a slave to it until somebody comes and opens the prison door, which was Jesus Christ, Amen. to set you free. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, we appreciate you bearing your heart. And I know that your heart's desire is for women and men who have been sexually abused to understand that there is a way out. I you know they have been through trauma, too, and it's very traumatizing. But praise the Lord through Jesus Christ in your finding him and his revealing himself to you brought freedom in your life. That's the only thing. Amen. I mean, because I took my master's in guidance and counseling, and there is no hope outside of Jesus. There is no healing outside of Jesus. So, and you know, I, I do a jail ministry. Yes. And I had joined the Women's Aglow. Yes, jail which is team wonderful. Down in Hamilton. Praise the Lord. County. And we go in every Wednesday. And, but I joined when I heard that between 85 and 95% of all women had been sexually abused, were incarcerated. So I signed then. And then I found out through one of the chaplains, she's gone now, but she said that every, every male that she had interviewed, and she worked at the workhouse and then at Hamilton County Justice Center, she said that every male that she had interviewed, 100% of them that were incarcerated had been sexually abused as well. Oh, how awful. And so I feel that, you know, the jails are looking at what they consider key components, you know, the addiction piece, the alcohol piece, the transportation, jobs, education, mm -hmm. all those things. But I think really the foundational, maybe fundamental issue is really sexual abuse, and it's not being addressed. Exactly. It's exactly. And that's why we need to talk about this. We need to expose it and find ways, which is through Jesus, of healing. Now, you, um, at one point, you did enter into a point of, like, smoking marijuana and taking some drugs, and did that, that didn't help you either, did it? Or did it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I had never been mellow. <laughs> um, and once when I was griping to God on the way home from a retirement party for one of my fellow teachers that I used to teach with, you know, I was... <sighs> asking the Lord, you know, why me, you know, and, and he said, well, would you be where you are today with me if none of this had happened? That's right. And you kind of resign yourself to the fact that you wouldn't be you if what you had gone through hadn't happened. Exactly. So. And to be used now to bring life to other women and other men. And healing. Exactly, healing. You, you're on the other side of the coin. Yes. And, it, and it's a glorious side. Well, in 1977, you started reading the Bible, but it didn't make sense in the beginning, did it? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but I was determined. I mean, I knew my life was trashed. I had started smoking on the Bicentennial, July 4th, 1976, smoking pot. And after a while, I just didn't care about anything yes so um you, it was a given... downhill slide until i ended up divorced and homeless and jobless and carless and out on the streets oh that's hard you'd given up you'd given up yeah. hope i had completely given up yes, hope. i had yes. gone up to commit suicide in colorado and that's a whole long story but you know, you just lose hope. And I want to say that there is always hope in Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 There is always hope. And 
I think suicide happens when you think your problem is bigger than God and things are never going to change and that there is no way out. But there always is a way out because God has a plan and we just have to resign ourselves to the fact that God is bigger than us and bigger than our problems and he knows what he's doing in our life regardless of how it looks and we just have to hang in there and have faith in God when you can't have faith in yourself anymore. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We appreciate your tuning in. You're listening to God's Story on WGNZ with Chaplain Lynn speaking with Marjean. If you want more information, you can email me at chaplainlynnradio at gmail.com. Marjean, would you like to share your testimony of your coming to Jesus Christ and the highlights of that testimony? Oh, yes, (laughs) ma'am. Amen. I was delivered from drugs and alcohol and cigarettes before I even knew the word. Well, praise God for that. Which some people don't even think can be done, but it was. And then um, I was invited to a Pentecostal service. I didn't know it was Pentecostal. And the music was great. And all at once, Pastor stood up and said, let's pray. And everybody stood up. And and using my best teacher look, I looked around. I thought, my heavens, I can't even hear what Pastor is praying because all these people were talking. And then I figured out they were not speaking English. (laughs) And I knew that I had gotten finally to a place where Joel 2 was evident that they were speaking in tongues. And I had been reading my Bible since 77, and I found out that God existed when I saw my grandma after she had died in Phoenix, elevated, and the invisible became visible, and the visible then became invisible. And and I knew that the Bible, though, existed when I, as truth, Before that, it had just been kind of like a history book. But when I heard everybody speaking in tongues, it was like, well, the Bible is true, and I'd better get my life in order. Hallelujah. And and when Pastor asked if anybody needed to be saved that night, that, you know, if they didn't know for a fact that if they died that night, they'd go to heaven, and they need to get down front and get right with the Lord. And I was hoping so, thinking so, believing so, praying so you know, that I would go to heaven, but I didn't know so. So I got right up and went down, and I don't remember, Linda, this day, whether I prayed the sinner's prayer or somebody prayed for me or somebody prayed with me, or I don't remember anything except for that night when I went out those double wide doors. I knew that if I died that night, I was going to heaven. Oh, wonderful. And I was just so ecstatic. And then... That was January 13th, 1991, right when the Iraq War, first war was starting. And then on March the 17th, 1991, I was filled with the Holy Ghost, as with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And I went down laughing and come up laughing, thinking that God would really love in me full time. I mean, I was just amazed. And I didn't even know I could sin till November of that year. And then I found out, yeah, I could still sin. But... It's been a journey becoming closer and closer to the Lord. And um, a guy came and spoke at the church that night, and I thought, well, good. This is the first time I won't have to go up and answer the altar call because he was talking on tithing, and I was tithing 11% because I didn't want to just do the minimum. And he said, no, no, it's 10% tithe, 10% offering, and three and a third percent to the poor. And I thought, ooh, hold that thought. Let me reconfigure my budget. And then God said, well, what about your time? And so that's when, and some people think it's a little legalistic, but the first two hours and 40 minutes of every day, I would be in my prayer closet with the Lord, reading his word and praying and meditating and journaling. And um, and that's when he started speaking truth to the lies of the devil that I had believed all those years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Yes. Praise the Lord. One of the things I had heard is that he said, Marjean, trust me. I'm perfect. I've never messed up. Trust me. And it's like, "Eh, Mm. I don't know. You know, trust was a huge issue. And and, um, tent meeting that um, people had near here, I was carrying this huge weight of sorrow and 
they started singing a song and God spoke with me and said, Marjean, you don't need to carry the weight of this burden. Jesus carried the weight of this burden when he carried the cross up to Golgotha. You can choose to keep carrying this weight or you can know that it's already been carried. That was another helpful evening. And I found out that any time I needed or tried to justify myself, if I would have a reconversation, trying to feel better about how something went, that that was a red flag that, you know, I needed to admit that I was not perfect. I had messed up and I was now smarter than I was before I had done it, which was helpful. And that I always found out that I did have a teachable spirit. When God said something to me, it was like, oh, thanks for your help in getting me one step closer to living the life that I need to live down here because I've always said that I would rather hear one word of correction from the Lord down here while I still had an opportunity of changing than to hear it in front of him up there and not have any recourse. Exactly, exactly. So I was grateful. And you had mentioned before about forgiveness, and it was difficult because, um, you know, I would forgive on one level, and then God would give me a break, and then he'd bring it around, and I'd find out again that I had to forgive at a different level and a deeper level. And then he got to the point where he said, well, okay, so are you hearing any grudges? Mm -hmm. And I thought, ooh, yeah, lots of them. <laughs> so that was sufficient. I hadn't had any medical since 79. I do now, praise God. But so I had gone to Dr. Jesus a lot of times for things to be healed. And I always found he was sufficient. I'm not advocating for not having medical, but he is sufficient and he is the healer. And one thing that he had healed was in my master's I heard the lie that depression is suppressed anger and I couldn't do anything about that what can you do about suppressed anger it's suppressed you know yeah, yeah. where are so, you so <laughs> you know how can I help that but then I had read this thing from Rick Joyner that said that depression is not suppressed anger it's anger against sin that either your conscience or someone else's conscience had been violated. And that is what causes the anger. And as soon as I read that, I thought, well, God, if depression is really a result of sin, your son already took care of the sin problem. So I knew that even though he hadn't delivered me exactly at that moment, that it was going to be gone because I had been in depression since five. Oh, a long time. Yeah. long time well and it comes and goes but you know it was getting scary because it was getting deeper and longer and darker and then when I read that it was I knew God was going to take care of the what had been called depression and which had been depression so it was taken care of at the cross of Calvary amen Amen. Wow. Everything was, either before, during, or after. I mean, he took 39 stripes, and the Center for Disease Control down in Atlanta says that there's 39 classifications of sicknesses. And so he's taken a stripe for every one of them. And he, by his beatings that he did, the thorns in his head, you know, everything that he went through, he accomplished something for us that not only did he take care of the sin problem, but by p his perfect life, he wants to put everything that he earned into our account so that he not only took care of the sin problem, he took care of the living problem because he said that he came to give the abundant life, and he did. But so often we're so self-focused and so involved in the negative that we don't understand anything about the abundant life. And um, just listening to Joseph Prince, that helped when he said that, you know, do you have a positive expectation of good? I said, well, of course I have a positive expectation of good. And whap, <laughs> immediately, within a couple of minutes, something happened in my brain immediately had gone to the negative. And I started... 
God started showing me really what a negative expectation of bad I had. Mm-hmm. And all that was tied in. And, and he's very gracious that, um, that he changes all of us bit by bit, piece by piece, dot by dot, you know, that he wants to redeem and restore our lives, and he does so when we give him the opportunity. The other huge turning point is when I was in my prayer closet, and I said, God, what's this grace thing? And I knew it was God's riches at Christ's expense, but it didn't make any sense to me that, you know, he did want me to be provided for, and he loved me unconditionally, and I had always been looking for love in the wrong arms, mm-hmm. you know, and you attract people that are pretty similar. So I was attracting pretty wounded people or people that were users or abusers. And um, it was a huge thing when I started listening to Andrew Womack too, that um, we are no longer under the law and it's impossible requirements to be blessed that Jesus took all of our condemnation and his perfect life qualifies us to receive his right standing in front of God so that we receive God's forgiveness, acceptance, love, and blessings forever. Amen Amen. and amen. Thank you for tuning in today to God's Story. We pray that you have been blessed. Make sure that you tune in next Wednesday at the same time, 1.30 p.m., for another edition of God's Story. If you'd like to reach God's story, you can email chaplainlynnradio at gmail.com. Jesus made peace through the blood of his cross to reconcile all things unto himself. Part of that all things is you and me. To reconcile is to restore to union and friendship after estrangement. God's deepest desire is to be close to you and to share his heart with you. He desires a deep, intimate relationship with you, wanting to walk and talk with you day by day. He does walk with us and talks with us through his written word, the Bible. The Bible tells God's story through the ages. God has a story that he would like to impart into your life. He loves to make himself known to his children. May your heart be open and may your eyes see God's gracious, loving hand move in your life today. Isn't it wonderful while living here on this earth that the creator of the universe who made you and me wants to be part of our lives? Jesus brought restoration of what has been stolen from us, true peace while living on this earth. John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. The lovely hymn written by Warren Cornell, Wonderful Peace has these words, Peace, peace, wonderful peace, coming down from the Father above, Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love. Thank you for tuning in today to God's Story. We pray that you have been blessed. Make sure that you tune in again next Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. or Friday at 12.30 p.m. for another edition of God's Story. If you would like to hear more God's Story broadcast, tune into YouTube or anywhere you download your favorite podcasts. One can also listen live at WGNZ.com. To reach God's Story, please email chaplainlynnradio at gmail.com. Jesus made peace through the blood of his cross to reconcile all things unto himself. Part of that all things is you and me. To reconcile is to restore to union and friendship after estrangement. God's deepest desire is to be close to you and share his heart with you. He desires a deep, intimate relationship with you and wants to walk and talk with you day by day. He does walk with us and talks with us through his written word, the Bible. The Bible tells God's story through the ages. God has a story that he would like to impart into your life. He loves to make himself known to his children. May your heart be open and may your eyes see God's gracious, loving hand moving in your life today. Isn't it wonderful while living life here on this earth that the creator of the universe 
who made you and me wants to be part of our lives? Jesus brought restoration of what has been stolen from us, true peace while living on this earth. John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. The lovely hymn written by Warren Cornell, Wonderful Peace, has these words. Peace, peace, wonderful peace, coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love. This is Chaplain Lynn saying, May the wonderful peace of Jesus Christ fill you to overflowing today. May you experience the depths of his sweet love and how much God loves you.